Thanks everyone for being in this session. Uh, my name is Ornella. I'll be the moderator for this session. Um, so we'll go in the order that uh, everybody appears in the program. So we'll start with uh, Vanilla Ice um, with uh, Brayden and then Listen and Learn with Ryan. Uh, you can be a loose cannon in hockey with uh, Stacy and finish up with skidding backwards with myself and Charlene. So without further ado, uh, in consideration of time, we'll go ahead and start up with uh, Brayden. Yeah, uh, I just don't have sharing privileges yet, Renella and Cheryl. Ornella is currently the host, so she has to give Brayden host privileges. <laughs> okay. Everyone see my screen okay and hear me? Perfect, I see a thumbs up, that's great. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, first things first, on behalf of uh, Stacy and myself, uh, Stacy, who you'll hear, fr hear from later, uh, and my co-author on this paper, um, thank you to the conference organizers uh, for putting together this entire event and uh, this session specifically. We're very excited to be able to gather uh, virtually despite not being able to gather in person. Um, we would like to dedicate this paper to Stacy's friend and colleague, Rod Murray, who passed away in uh, 2010. Rod came up with the title Vanilla Ice, uh, which we are happy to finally put to use as a tribute to Rod's work on hockey, race, and culture today. So I'll be sharing some work with you today that Stacy and I, I have had on the go for the last, I was trying to count how many years, I think it's almost five years, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, the larger study is a historical case study of uh, media narratives surrounding Gordie Howe. And today we're going to use the results of that study to explore some ideas surrounding race and specifically the policing of blackness within contemporary hockey culture. So let's go ahead and dive in. Perfect. So we begin by examining the qualities of the ideal hockey player established by Gordie Howe. As I mentioned, through a historical case study, uh, which examined North American media press, uh, we highlight how Howe's combination of controlled violence and humble manliness set the standard for a version of polite and modest hockey masculinity that remains central to hockey culture today. This portrayal involves, or this involves, sorry, sorry, the portrayal of how as a bashful, modest, and respectful player, including constant references to how's rural and colonial upbringing, uh, which then culminates in a gentlemanly masculinity where physical violence on the ice is counterbalanced with a shy and soft-spoken nature off the ice. In this 1963 feature piece uh, in McLean's magazine, Zowski notes that Howe's quote, most serious sin seems to lie in the wicked number of crossword puzzles he goes through, end quote. In the larger quote I have on the slide, we see these competing narratives of a violent but controlled style of play and a respectful, modest gentleman, or as the title of Zowski's article indicates, Gordy Howe, a hero. Interestingly, Kennedy and Silva's work highlights how violent acts without a perceived sense of control work to de-civilize a game which consistently struggles to quote, police the boundary between acceptable play and barbarism. For Zowski, for Zowski and the media then, how becomes this admirable, accessible, and even marketable, marketable embodiment of finely balanced manhood within the post-war period in North America? We argue that this idealized manhood creates a contemporary space where criminal, criminal acts of violence, retribution, hazing, or bullying serve as tools to protect, maintain, and perpetuate a broader culture of exclusivity and discrimination against those who do not conform uh, to this conservative view of acceptable conduct by playing hockey the right way, which as we'll see is also synonymous with the white way. 
So how do we go about theorizing and exploring this dynamic? Eduardo Benilla Silva uh, describes new racism as subtle, institutional, and apparently non-racial. He calls attention to a racial ideology and racially based frameworks that have been used to justify and explain the racial status quo in the United States. In particular, he highlights structural, institutional, and ideological frameworks or foundations of racism, and he points to the common cultural frames and representations that shape historical and contemporary understandings of race. As a result, Vanilla Silva shifts attention away from seeing racism as a product of individual psychological dispositions or even individual prejudice, and instead encourages us to view racism as a set of racial practices that reproduce racial domination and sustain white privilege. Operating within the culture of hockey and stemming from historical frames and representations of how, color bland racism is a new racism practice that functions as a hockey specific explanation and justification for why black players are treated differently, but which otherizes softly by making no overt reference to race. We derive our description of this frame from the combination of color blind racism and gender bland sexism, a term coined by Musto and colleagues in order to explain the recent shift in the character of women's sport coverage, quote, away from being overtly denigrating to being ostensibly respectful. So how does this play out in contemporary hockey culture? I'm going to focus on just a couple examples that Stacy and I have written on, and I think we'll hear about a few more as uh, the other presentations take place as well. The code of colorblind racism stifles dissent uh, and difference among black players as seen through the experiences of Nigerian born hockey player, Akeem Aliou. While playing junior hockey, Aliou learned that criticism of, cult of the culture of the sport would not be tolerated. When he resisted longstanding practices of hazing as a player with the Windsor Spitfires in 2005, Aliou was physically assaulted by a teammate, suspended for fighting back, traded and labeled a troublemaker. By standing up to hazing, Aliou became a problem and resistance was seen as playing the race card. As Joyce has detailed extensively, the repercussions of hockey's most famous hazing incident have left behind a mixed legacy. For Aliou, the event meant a lack of opportunity within the game, a foreboding reputation as a troublemaker and a constant chip on his shoulder. For the Canadian Hockey League, according to Joyce, small progress has been made to address hazing incidents. Unfortunately, that progress demanded that a black athlete stand up and speak out against the culture that was and is specifically designed to police and exclude a large part of his identity. Not surprisingly, Aliou's treatment following the hazing incident led him to keep quiet for more than a decade about incidents of racism he later experienced in professional hockey. He, or, uh, yeah, in, in November 2019, however, Aliou revealed instances of racial abuse from then NHL coach Bill Peters when the two worked together in the American Hockey League in the 09-010 season. Through his social media accounts, Aliou detailed a particularly vivid encounter where Peters hurled multiple racial slurs in his direction, citing displeasure with the amount of rap music being played in the locker room to that point. In sharing the horrific details of his experience, Ali once again shed light on a toxic culture designed for conformity rather than inclusivity. Through more, though more overt than other examples of color bland racism, the Ali Peters exchange demonstrates the level of intolerance for blackness, black culture, and in turn, black athletes within contemporary hockey environments. Another particularly vivid display of the code of colorblind racism is Darren Pang's comparison of P.K. Subban and Alex Petrangelo during a 2010 TSN broadcast. In the midst of a panel discussion regarding the, at the time, young Montreal Canadiens defenseman, Pang states, and I'm just gonna play the clip here because I, I really don't think you can play this clip too many times. 
As you mentioned, part of the process, it's funny how we are with these athletes. P.K. Subban comes in with the World Juniors, playing junior hockey in Ontario, and he's full of life, he's full of personality, he's a gregarious sort, and almost the more gregarious he got and the more full of life he got, the more everybody wants to settle him down. I can tell you this right now, there's another example in the league that maybe he should try to duplicate, and that is another young defenseman. Ever seen that P.K. Subban is the best 21-year-old defenseman? Alex Petrangelo also represented Canada. He's a 20-year-old. He's a first-round pick, and he does everything on the ice, off the ice, the right way, the right way, and he endears himself to his teammates because of that. But you almost feel bad for P.K. because he's got a lot of personality, but it's time to settle things down a little bit and just play hockey and be Okay, so our goal here is, of course, not to out Pang as a racist due to this unintentional but extremely telling verbal slip. However, this choice of words points to the broader racial filter through which Pang interprets Subban's gregarious personality and demonstrates how racialized views of black and white players are deflected by citing professionalism and a need to settle down, a need to play the right way. This lens, which reflects the precedent set by representations of how, has followed PK around for his entire career. For the sake of time, I think this example stands alone quite well to demonstrate this colorblind discourse. As Gary Wannell observes, quote, examinations of representations of black sportsmen still tends to suggest that for them, the rules are different, the conventions more strict and the options more limited. On a whole, hockey culture remains predominantly white, male, and unwelcoming to those who diverge from the expected norms of the sport. In the summer of 2020, as the world of sport began to cope with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and racial tensions within the United States and around the world began to rise rapidly following highly publicized instances of police brutality and murder, the NHL was given an opportunity to take initial steps towards addressing the code of colorblind racism and racial injustice more broadly. While athletes around the world took part in what became known as a general strike in an attempt to raise awareness surrounding white supremacy and anti-Black racism, the NHL moved forward with its scheduled games, choosing instead to stand for a moment of solidarity and skate for Black lives. In his response to the league's lack of action, Minnesota Wild defenseman Matt Dumba echoed his frustration on Sportnet 590. He said, quote, the NHL is always last to the party on these issues. It's kind of sad and disheartening for me and members of the Hockey Diversity Alliance, and I'm sure for other guys across the league. But if no one stands up and does anything, then it's the same thing. That's silence. You're just on the outside looking in on actually being leaders and evoking real change when you have such an opportunity to do so. What Dumba articulates is an environment where the very black players whose character is questioned culture is policed and identity is excluded, are then forced to be the only voices supporting, demanding, and forcing meaningful change. Black athletes are in one breath ostracized and othered, and in the next are called on to be the leaders of a massive cultural shift. And thank you very much. Just admitting people to the room here. Thanks, uh, Braden. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, presentation, and uh, if you can make uh, if you can make them host so that we can switch up quickly. Thank you. Uh, I think that's me then. Uh, all right, let me just throw this up. And All right, uh, that's a bit uh, busy and I do apologize for that, but uh, there are many slides. There's something to look at while I'm uh, discussing. So, hi everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Chivera. Uh, sorry, you know, admit, okay, there we go. Okay, I apologize. Uh, my name is Ryan Chivera, I'm a settler scholar of Ukrainian and French heritage based out of London, Ontario, on the lands of the Anishinaabe, uh, Haudenosaunee, uh, the Nepewak, and Atawano peoples. Uh, I also want to provide, uh, I guess, a quick 
content warning. Uh, and though I don't discuss the murder of George Floyd in detail, I recognize that the player tweets that I go through are largely in response to this moment. Uh, and I recognize that these traumas don't simply uh, dissipate over time. So I've tried to take a great care with this discussion. So for a little bit of a research background of myself, I'm interested in listening experiences, uh, primarily how white settlers, which, I, which is a broad term, I, I understand, uh, how they understand, reflect on, communicate their listening experiences in moments uh, where they're being challenged by artists uh, and leaders of Black, Indigenous, uh, Asian cultures, uh, mostly in the areas of music and sports, as we'll see today. So right now I'm going to focus on, as I mentioned, NHL player responses to Black Lives Matter movements, uh, discussions about race and calls for response and justice. Again, a bit scattered, but just something to uh, look through. So when the support for Black Lives Matter protests grew throughout 2020, some of the NHL players took to social media to back the movement and join marches led by black people across North America. Uh, listen and learn, uh, as you'll see in some of these, uh, became key words for white players showing support. Around the same time, uh, black professional hockey players created the Hockey Diversity Alliance uh, to push for sustainable change at various levels of hockey. However, in October of 2020, uh, the HDA announced that it would, quote, operate independent of the NHL, and quote, after not receiving any response to its pledge. There's a collection of powerful voices in the NHL uh, coming from players, coaches, managers, league reps. Uh, however, unlike the WNBA, uh, the NBA, and to some extent the NFL, most players are white, and this can be, as I said, varying degrees extended to coaches, managers, and representatives, depending on the league. As a result, uh, and though I, I'm not to say that I hope it stays that way, but the NHL offers a sample from which to analyze the responses of people who identify as white or are of white European settler descent to the calls for justice and support from black, indigenous uh, people of color within and outside of hockey. So the purpose of this brief analysis is to begin to break down uh, the tangible work of responding to these calls for justice. And part of this process, as you'll see, is the cataloging and analysis of these range of responses. So for the larger picture, this analysis is based on a sense of responsibility that white members of the hockey community uh, must also pick up the work in spaces uh, that have uh, sometimes become whiteness and exclusivity and learn how to participate again or in vastly different ways. Of course, this is done uh, in response to the leadership of Black and Indigenous people and people of color, but there are moments of self-reflection for white people that occur in these moments uh, and processes, and this is where I'm attempting to step in in this case. Uh, this is not meant as a recentering of the white voice by any means, um, or of the white player or person, but part of a responsibility to pick up uh, this work within our own community and speak to our own people and avoid continuing to burden black leaders with the work of educating and re-educating white people. Uh, I'll just continue to admit some people if that's okay. And I'll jump a slide. Okay. Um, so further, this is part of a larger process of learning how to listen again or as solo scholar Dylan Robinson notes, uh, becoming completely unfamiliar with what listening is, while also respecting the unique circumstances of the work for indigenous sovereignty and black justice in settler colonial North America. So some key guiding questions include how, uh, excuse me, how are white players comprehending uh, the murder of George Floyd by police, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the charge of racism in the league and game? And how are white players conceiving of and communicating what they feel is a valuable response? So an overview. On May 29th, 2020, uh, Evander Kane, a black player in the NHL, spoke on various TV networks and radio shows in Canada and the United States. And uh, as I want to know, reasserted his call. Uh, it wasn't the first time that he called out to white players. Uh, two white NHL hockey players to speak up and out against racism. 
Over the next five days, uh, white players from young stars to veterans uh, release statements through social media channels. And I've gathered statements of, 20, of 27 white American and Canadian players and two prominent Eastern European players of Slovenian and Russian descent. Of note is that 19 of the players who did post, uh, that is again white players, uh, were or have served as a designated leader of the team. Uh, the players ranged in popularity from Alexander Ovechkin with 2.6 million followers on Twitter to Mark Borowiecki with 9,300 uh, and counting followers on Instagram. But it's worth noting that the number of followers doesn't necessarily relate to the depth of thought or reflection conveyed through a post. Uh, and of note it is in comparison with superstars from other sports, it's clear that hockey players are not as popular as other athletes uh, in North America, to say the least. For example, LeBron James has nearly 50 million followers on Twitter alone. Serena Williams has 10.8 million, and Megan Rapino has 925.9 thousand followers. I know this is not surprising. What is important here is that the dominant audience uh, that NHL players have historically reached. Uh, which is other white men. So other notable names on the player statement include, uh, as we see here, Connor McDavid, Sidney Crosby through his foundation, Steven Stamkos, John Tavares, Blake Wheeler. Uh, for this uh, analysis, I tracked repeated words or similar phrases throughout the post to try and get a sense of how these white men were comprehending uh, what a valuable response consisted of after Evander Kane's call. Uh, the phrase Black Lives Matter or hashtag BLM was only mentioned in 10 out of 29 posts. Uh, and George Floyd's name was mentioned in nearly half, 14 of 29. And that became a really uncomfortable moment, uh, essentially doing a keyword search uh, for his name. But it represented an, if the players understood the context of what's uh, going on and being asked of them uh, in this case, in this scenario. Um, an acknowledgement or mention of racism occurred in 21 of 29, and listen, as I noted, was the most consistent sentiment expressed as it came up in 22 of 29 posts. Uh, an acknowledgement of privilege came up in 18 of 29, and a need to learn or do better uh, was involved in 10 posts each according. Interestingly, uh, white supremacy was only mentioned once across the 29 posts, and I know it's tough to read, but it is in uh, current Vancouver Canucks goaltender, former Washington Capitals goaltender, Brayden Holby. Uh, he was the Capitals goaltender at the time, apologies. So early conclusions. So what we see prominently in this collection of posts is a sense of a need to acknowledge or declare recognition of their privilege as a male professional hockey player and the power that comes with that position, and in some cases, the privilege granted by their whiteness. There was often a move to point out that they cannot understand the experiences of black players or people, but they are committed to listening. The low appearance of Black Lives Matter and a high appearance of privilege or a sentiment of that sort suggests many refrain from addressing the larger issues of systemic racism, uh, the abolition of police, the deep connection to police and military, or the use of military and war metaphors in sport in general and in hockey in particular. Uh, and in the NHL, and chose to understand this as a moment to express an awareness of the necessity to reflect on their own position, sort of the beginnings of uh, questions of positionality, potentially. A turn inwards potentially allowed them to deal with a known subject uh, as they've been pushed to be uncomfortable in this case, and perhaps outline concrete steps forward uh, on an individual basis. Many mentioned teaching their children uh, about you know, different steps to take and how to listen. So for many, it may have been the first time they've been asked to confront and name their privilege. Uh, so this re recognition became a main goal. And as I've said, hopefully a first step. Uh, many expressed the need to listen, but and the post reflect, reflected, excuse me, a sense of respect, and though not, not always urgency, to answer the call put forth by Vanny King. What it means to listen or how this listening would be different from listening experiences before this recognition uh, was left unclear in these posts. And whereas, uh, for example, we've seen a hard refusal on the part of the HDA to allow the NHL to benefit from a partnership uh, without shifting their, their listening experiences and actions. So acknowledging that some of these uh, are early statements from players 
part of a potential project uh, moving forward, though, of course, very difficult, uh, would be to follow up and continue to encourage a kind of self-reflection and have the conversations that can move beyond spaces of pure recognition uh, and a, a single sort of turning in uh, and have the conversations that can move beyond spaces uh, of pure uh, recognition, sorry. Um, and move towards a sort of rethinking or recognition of listening and participation. I've discussed something similar in the realm of popular music and how white settlers understand their listening experiences in response to the work of indigenous musicians, such as a tribe called Red and Bucky St. Marie, and the possibility of listening moving towards a kind of surrender, uh, potentially materially and psychologically. In any case, as we continue to witness and have important discussions with the leaders of these movements, having discussions with the listeners, in this case, who have a recognizable influence, can also be uh, significant. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we'll move to Stacy now, uh, next for his paper. Yeah, I don't seem to have screen sharing yet. Maybe you're setting it up. Yeah, Ryan, if you could move the, the hosting duties to uh, Stacy, that would be great. Thanks. Sorry about that. How, where, where do I do that? Uh, the three dots on Stacy's image, it'll give you the ability to just make him host. Okay. Give you the Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Hopefully you can see that uh, first slide. All right. Okay, so this presentation uh, began actually as an undergraduate directed study project completed by Adam McKenzie, who happens to be Braden's brother uh, at the University of Alberta Augustana campus in 2015, originally titled The Black Eye of the NHL, Evander Kane, New Racism, and the Marred Racial Landscape of Canada's Contemporary Game. Evander Kane has been a controversial and complex figure in hockey since making his National Hockey League debut with the Atlanta Thrashers in 2009. Following the move of the Thrashers franchise to Winnipeg in 2011, Kane play, played four and a half seasons with the Winnipeg Jets. He was traded to the Buffalo Sabres in 2015 and to the San Jose Sharks in 2018, where he remains after signing a long-term contract. In recent years, Kane has become an outspoken critic of the conformity, intolerance, and racism fostered by hockey culture. For example, in June 2020, Kane and Akeem Alou co-founded the Hockey Diversity Alliance, which put forward a number of initiatives aimed at dismantling systemic racism in hockey and promoting inclusion, social justice, and accessibility in the sport. There are many aspects of Kane's career that could be of interest to scholars of sport, race, and culture. This presentation explores some of the media narratives surrounding Kane as a member of the Winnipeg Jets during the 2012-13 hockey season as a means of analyzing the broader policing of blackness in the NHL. Specifically, we focus on the public reaction to a photo Kane posted to Twitter in December 2012 showing him pretending to call boxer Floyd Mayweather with two substantial stacks of cash substituting for a phone and the backlash against Kane's January 2013 haircut when he arrived at the arena with the acronym YMCMB, Young Money, Cash Money, Billionaires, shaved into his head. The case study is based on depictions of Kane and the Winnipeg Free Press, the Winnipeg Sun, and other media outlets. We argue that the response to Kane's actions demonstrated his uncomfortable fit within the white culture of hockey. Racialized constructions of black hockey players as flashy outsiders with attitude problems and potential gangsters in need of discipline draw upon longstanding stereotypes of black athletes as thugs and criminals. Kane's treatment during these incidents also illustrates the concept of colorblind racism 
that Braden discussed earlier in relation to the NHL's double standard for white and black players. Colorblind racism helps to maintain white privilege and dominance while taming the threatening black bodies under the NHL's control. After playing 12 games for Dinamo Minsk in the Continental Hockey League during the 2012-13 NHL lockout, Kane returned to his hometown of Vancouver in November 2012 to train while waiting for the work stoppage to end. On December 19th, he posted what he thought was a harmless picture on Twitter. The photo featured Kane on a hotel balcony in Las Vegas using a pile of $100 bills in place of a cell phone. In the words of Harrison Mooney, a writer with Yahoo Sports, the picture was intended as a joke, a reference to a conversation between Fiddy Cent and Floyd Mayweather that also incorporated phones made of money stacks, but it was a joke that sailed over the heads of the hockey community. Although Kane insisted that the picture had nothing to do with the NHL lockout, the incident stirred a hornet's nest on social media. For example, fans and media commentators immediately took to Twitter to force their, to voice their displeasure with Kane's perceived selfishness and arrogance. One fan tweeted at Kane, you're so ignorant, this is what you think fans want to see be, during the lockout, be a professional. Another wrote, if I could return my jersey of you, I would. Your antics continue to disappoint and you're just not the man I hoped you were. Other words used to describe Kane's actions included immature, absolutely stupid, or drug money. Damian Cox of Sportsnet tweeted, shout out to Evander Kane for reminding us what spoiled, entitled, and unaccomplished athletes look like. Gary Lawless of the Winnipeg Free Press also weighed in with criticism of the Jets winger. Another day, another firestorm for Kane. It happens too often and if changes aren't made by the player, the team will make its own changes and deal him. Lawless also stated, Kane isn't very coachable on or off the ice. He's a talent, but he's also a problem. There's no disputing that. Likewise, after referring to Kane as the winger without a clue, Paul Friesen of the Winnipeg Sun offered Kane some advice for living and working in Winnipeg. Earth calling to Evander, flaunting your cash just isn't a Winnipeg thing. We prefer low key. Show offs don't mix well here. In these responses, fans and columnists raise concerns about Kane's blackness indirectly under the guise of attitude, professionalism, and conformity. This is an excellent example of the frame of colorblind racism. Harrison Mooney describes the public response to Kane's photo as a misunderstood hip hop culture moment that illustrates the complex clash between hockey culture and hip hop culture. Although Mooney argues that this is not a direct conflict of white culture versus black culture per se, he does acknowledge there is, of course, some obvious crossover there. Mooney notes that similar to many football or basketball athletes and hip hop artists, Kane has a certain swagger that makes traditional hockey fans uncomfortable. Similarly, Joshua Cloak in his article, Evander Kane and the NHL's Culture of Bullshit, argues that hockey reinforces a classy team first mentality more than any other major North American sport. At the same time, the NHL is constantly struggling to expand its base, placing Kane in what Cloak calls a metaphoric struggle between the league's desire to draw in more fans on the backs of star personalities and the game's staunch traditionalist element, one that would label Kane's deviation from the prescribed and bland brand of Gretzkyan politeness as an act of treason. Although Cloak does not directly discuss Kane's blackness, we see, we see a racial filter being applied to Kane because of his unique personality and his violation of the standard hockey ideals epitomized by white captains and leaders, going back to Gordie Howe and extending through Jonathan Taves and Sidney Crosby, among others. Although Kane's timing was undoubtedly poor and his sensitivity was lacking, particularly when we consider the jobs and income lost by many non-hockey players due to the NHL lockout, the criticism that he received targeting his character demonstrates the degree of hypersensitivity that frequently surrounds the behavior of black hockey players. Before the furor around this Twitter incident subsided, 
Kane again caused controversy off the ice when he arrived at the rank for a practice in late January 2013 with YMCMB, as I mentioned, young money, cash money, billionaires uh, shaved into his head. This was a reference to a group of hip hop artists signed to a record label founded by black rapper Lil Wayne. Young Money was an imprint of Cash Money Records whose roster of hip hop acts included Drake and Nicki Minaj. Like the money phone photo, the haircut literally paraded Kane's blackness around on the back of his head for all to see. Then in early February, 2013, the Hockey News released excerpts from an interview with Kane in which he commented on negative perceptions of him in Winnipeg and on social media, stating, I think a good portion of it is because I'm black and I'm not afraid to say that. Perhaps the most notable response to this assertion was that of Don Cherry, hockey's self-appointed gatekeeper, who criticized Kane for playing the race card. Cherry admonished, see, when he says stuff like that, it gets the crowd against him. Of all the places, Winnipeg, an absolutely ridiculous thing to say. And whoever's advising this kid better start advising him. Get him under control, because to say a thing like that is absolutely asinine as far as I'm concerned. Cherry added, he's got to stop and grow up, keep his mouth shut and just play hockey. He also explained that even after the money phone picture, I was the one that stuck up for him. I said, look, he's just a kid having fun. He's only 21 years old, but he's got to straight, he's got to straighten out a little. You can't be a loose cannon in hockey. You can in football and you can in basketball, but not in hockey. It's no coincidence that Cherry made the explicit choice to bring up both football and basketball and those sports stronger associations with blackness when speaking about the need for a black hockey player to fall in line. Again, through perhaps the loudest voice in hockey, the expectations of hockey culture's whiteness were made clear for all to see. And Cherry's coded racial comments fit within the NHL's broader pattern of disciplining, policing, and containing the league's young black players. This is a subject we hope to investigate further through the lens of Evander Kane and other players who diverge from the expected racialized norms of the sport. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks Stacy. All right, I will see if I can figure out how to move this back. Or Ornella, are you already still a host? No, you gotta move it to me. All right. Or to Char and me. <laughs> okay. Trying to find you. Uh, it's under Charlene Weaving, Stacy. Okay. I'm just going to go to my gallery, put my gallery. Oh, there we go. That, that, must, that may be easier. You wouldn't know I taught five or six classes on Zoom this week, <laughs> would you? Okay, there we go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there we are. That should work. Okay. This looks like uh, new slideshow. This Okay. Okay, everyone. Thank you. So Arnella and I began this project by finding our expertise on gender and racism. As a result of the pandemic, this project has morphed into a much larger endeavor. And thus, for the purpose of this presentation, the scope and analysis is limited to the time period between 2014 and 2016. 
Drawing on the work of Lorenz and Murray, Dickerson and Toniero, we argue that Subban is under constant scrutiny in sport, in a sport that has long failed to appreciate racism in its culture and that his outsider status frames his public image. Through a socio-historical case study, we examine how Subban's masculinity is celebrated, critiqued and stereotyped. Subban has experienced racism throughout his hockey career. However, we start with his single Olympic appearance with Team Canada at the 2014 Sochi Games. At these games, an image of a white fan in blackface wearing a Subban jersey went viral on social media and outrage rightly ensued. Later that same year, a French Montreal theater company, Théâtre du Rideau Vert, featured a white actor in blackface wearing full Habs gear with this helmet like bragging about a lucrative contract, which in his opinion was thanks to his, his admiring fans. Lasting just about a minute, the scene called back to minstrel shows, which have a long history in North America and Europe, including French and English Montreal. According to journalists, according to Howard, blackface incidents are often labeled as harmless fun to justify rationale for contemporary blackface, or in this case, supposedly celebrating Subban. Specifically, Howard argues, quote, blackface is a performance embodied by definition and therefore becomes a quintessential expression of embodied racism's humor, end quote. The all-white cast of the Montreal play mocked Subban for securing a 72 million eight-year contract, which made him the highest paid defenseman in the NHL. This incident was particularly complicated by its occurrences, one among many in Quebec, where race and racism carry with them particular contentious connotations. The Théâtre dismissed, minimized, and even called out the outrage expressed at blackface as an overreaction. Some French media construing it as underappreciation for Quebec's francophone culture. In game one of the 2014 playoff series against Boston, when Subban scored the winning winner, the game winner in double overtime, some fans resorted to throwing water bottles on Subban and lashing out with racist tweets. They called Subban the N-word and the hashtag N-word was trending following the game. Black hockey players in and out of the NHL have long faced overt racism, often the form of racial slurs from opponents. And more recent incidents remind us that this is not the preserve of hockey, nor are they absent from the backstage of elite sport. Perceived difference in sporting white spaces disturbs and negative responses to it often proliferate on social media, where casual racism is largely unregulated. Ben reacted to the tweets by indicating that he would move on and he didn't care what the fans thought. In addition to focusing on the positive, we note here in his response, qualified as classy by one columnist in the Montreal Gazette. Subban also chose to distinguish the online activity from the fandom or even the hockey system saying, quote, whoever that is, they'll get dealt with, but it's completely separate from this league or the Boston Bruins organization, end quote. He did not speculate on who should be blamed or on the arena incidents and on their connection with the organization. To hockey observers like Montreal Gazette columnist Jack Todd, rink and online incidents were linked and Subban's response was, quote, too conciliatory. In the face of a climate in which fans booed whenever Subban touched the puck and Boston columns puzzlingly called Subban, quote, despicably villainous. On a surface, Montreal was believed to be a good fit for Subban given the lively culture uh, of food, fashion, and fun. However, early on, Subban was critiqued for his spirited sallies or goal celebrations, notably his miming of an archer on one knee. Opponents, teammates, commentators, fans, and other NHLers found his sallies, his fashion, and his demeanor too flashy. 
Subban is quote unquote out there, falling, failing to perform humility well enough and to conform to a specific white masculine Canadian middle-class standard that can be qualified as blandness. For Coyne, these performative white bland identities prevent fans from becoming attached to players, leaving a vacuum which fans have to fill in with their imagination. In Subban's case, we argue that this opens up the opportunity for him to be cast as a disruptor. The literature underscores that negative reactions to black athletes' so-called exuberance is, clear, is a clear trend in the predominantly black National Football League and the National Basketball Association. As Highland discusses about the men in the final of the um, Olympic 100 meters race, black masculine athletes often contentious performances to the camera during celebrations or introductions often undermine white expectations of them as not threatening, dehumanized, bland brands, instead presenting their own story on their own terms. According to journalist C. Gillis, even after Subban won the best defenseman trophy for the NHL in 2013, the Norris, quote, the sense lingered that the hockey establishment wanted to put him in his place, end quote. Habs coach Michel Therrien um, referred to Subban as a thoroughbred that required guidance, also calling up common dehumanizing tropes of black athletes as animalistic. In September 2015, Subban donated $10 million, a sum higher than his $9 million annual salary, to Montreal's Children's Hospital, which referred to the gift as, quote, the largest philanthropic commitment by a sports figure in Canadian history, end quote. Coin suggests that NHL players' co uh, common visits to uh, children's hospitals humanize them and create intimacy with fans, associating them with a more feminine and vulnerable image. But despite his immense dom donation, Subban has not reaped expected public relations benefits. In fact, that year, Subban's last season with the Habs, his teammates did not nominate him for the King Clancy Trophy, awarded for leadership on and off the ice, and one's humanitarian efforts. Subban was snubbed over Captain Max uh, Pacioretty, who raised funds for, uh, to purchase an MRI machine for the Montreal General Hospital. Significantly, Subban graciously declared Pacioretty deserved it and that he too had voted for him. Now, it is notable that Subban's donation was accompanied by personal connections with some of the hospital's young patients, frequent solo visits to the hospital, many of them undocumented, that is outside of the regular media ties team's visits. Rather than garner goodwill among his teammates, this may have alienated Subban's locker room as further presumed evidence of arrogance and individualism. Note that money links this case with the subject of the 2014 theater minstrel representation. At the end of June 2016, to great consternation and confusion, it was announced that the Canadiens had traded Subban to the Nashville Predators. Some speculated that his personality was too big for the dressing room, read too black. Others noted that his outspokenness was too difficult to handle. Marcy de Michel, who analyzed the trade for hockeywriters.com wrote that quote, not everyone likes the celebrations or the interviews, his obsessions with his obsession with clothes or his off, off ice personal marketing. Some even viewed him as a destruction. This was the culmination of years of opposition to the difference he represented in many ways. Spearheaded by the def deviance of his presence within the white space of hockey, his actions and spirit were read as defiant to the authority and authenticity of white management, culture, and norms of hockey. Hostility to Subban's public persona tells us a lot about the supposed neutrality of Canadian cultural practices and traditions, and the challenge that it poses to a hegemonic Canadian hockey identity defined within a white framework. Three years prior to the infamous trade, 
days after Subban's nomination for the Norris Trophy, Montreal Gazette journalist Jack Todd asked, quote, why so much criticism directed at Subban when he is far from the first black player in the league, end quote. Todd interviewed Kevin Weeks, TV hockey analyst and ex hockey player who is black himself and has known Subban since hockey camps. Weeks expressed that hockey's immediate reaction is to hate Subban because they have seen nothing like him before. The journalist concluded that Subban's racial identity is an undeniable factor, writing, quote, hockey is unique in that black superstars are as rare as, well, as rare as Subban. Because he's unique, Subban faces a special set of problems. The hockey world is still getting used to the idea of the black superstar. And that's where Subban has hit rough waters at times, end quote. Thank you.